Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for joining us. So uh, my name is Gabriel Jamie and I'm a research scientist in the Department of Zoology at the University of Cambridge and also a research associate at the uh, Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology at the University of Cape Town. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you about a truly remarkable group of birds uh, called the parasitic finches, which occur across large parts of Africa. Uh, so these consist of the indigo birds and widers, and they're all members of the genus Vidua. And in particular, I'm going to tell you a bit about how the evolution of mimicry and speciation has proceeded in this group. So before I go into detail about indigo birds and widers, I want to give you a bit of background about brood parasitism. So brood parasitism is the phenomenon when an organism forgoes its parental duties and instead forces another organism to rear its young. Among birds, perhaps the best known example of brood parasites come from cuckoos. So here you can see a nestling common cuckoo uh, being fed by its reed warbler foster parent. And we call the cuckoo the parasite in this interaction, and we call the foster parent the host. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the parasitic finches and particularly the indigo birds and widers. So these are all members of the genus Vidua. Now there are about 19 species of Vidua finch and they all lay their eggs in members of the grass finch family. Vidua finches are, are mostly uh, highly specialized parasites with each species laying the egg in the nest of just a single species of astralid finch, though there are a couple of exceptions. Unlike many other brood parasites, young Vidua do not kill their nestmates but are instead raised alongside them and sometimes alongside other parasitic young. So this means that a single nest can contain multiple host and multiple parasite young together. So the host family to the indigo birds, the astralid finches, are quite unusual among birds in that uh, while the nestlings of most birds are dull and cryptically patterned, astralid young boast arguably the most elaborate and diverse appearances of any bird in the world. Some have an almost otherworldly appearance with luminous papillae lining the gape and complex combinations of spots and bars adorning the palate. So here you can see the young of a few species of astralid finch. Uh, I've got a melba finch on the left, a red-billed fire finch in the center, a locust finch on the right, and you can see how diverse they are. So what is even more remarkable is that previous work, uh, particularly by Jürgen Nikolai and Robert Payne, had reported that uh, Vidua nestlings visually resemble their host species nestlings. Now, while this work laid the foundation for our understanding of the Vidua finch radiation, uh, methodological limitations at the time meant that the existence of this mimicry could not be tested in a systematic or quantitative manner, nor could it be tested from a bird's visual perspective. Now, this is important because subjective human assessments are not necessarily good proxies for similarity as perceived by birds, uh, since birds process colour and pattern differently uh, from humans. Moreover, nestling begging displays involve multiple modalities, incorporating not just visual but vocal and postural components too. Now, while previous authors had suggested that video nestlings may also match the begging calls of their hosts, again, this had never been tested quantitatively, nor in comparison with the begging calls of other co-occurring host species. And the ideas of postural mimicry had never been investigated before in this or any other brood parasite system. So um, until recently, the hypothesis that video nestlings exhibit specialized adaptations to the host still awaited a rigorous test. So on this slide, you can see a, a, par a parasitic purple indigo bird chick on the right uh, with two Jameson's firefinch chicks on the left. And whilst they look similar now as chicks, they'll grow up to look very different as adults. So to quantitatively test the mimicry in the system, we had to develop a new method to photograph inside the mouth of the nestling birds to allow us to generate standardized detailed photographs which measured color also in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. This involved gently holding the chick so that it bit on the apex of a prism. This allowed the inside of the mouth to be projected evenly onto the opposing flat surface of the prism, which was then photographed with a specially modified camera that allowed ultraviolet, as well as, as, well as um, other wavelengths of light, to be measured. The process didn't harm the chicks and they were returned to the nests after being photographed. And these are the photos that result. Here you can see the mouth markings of 10 species of astralid finch occurring at our field site in southern Zambia, many of which are hosts to indigo birds and widers. You can see how diverse and species specific the mouth markings are.
To investigate mimicry, we focused on three pairs of parasites and hosts occurring at our field site in southern Zambia. These were the pintailed wider, which lays its egg in the nest of the common waxbill, the broad-tailed paradise wider, which lays its egg in the nest of the orange ring petilia, and the purple indigo bird, which lays its egg in the nest of Jameson's firefinch. And indeed here you can see the striking mimicry in both colour and pattern of the respective hosts of each of these three parasitic species. So here you have the pintailed wider common waxball comparison, the broad-tailed paradise wider orange ring petilia comparison, and the purple indigo bird Jameson's firefinch comparison. Uh, now, this mimicry is also supported by statistical analyses that we did, which explore the colour and pattern variation from a bird's visual perspective. So I, I won't go into the details of how we did this now, but if you're interested, I'd, uh, I'd recommend reading our recent paper that was published earlier this year in Evolution. Our quantitative analysis uh, revealed that while the mimicry is very good, there are often consistent differences in the mouth markings of parasite and host. So here in this comparison between the pintailed wider and the common waxbill, you can see differences in the pattern of black on the tip of the upper mandible and in the size of the spots on the upper palate. Now, we don't yet know for certain the adaptive significance of these uh, differences, uh, but again, for potential hypotheses that could explain it, I'd recommend reading our, our evolution paper. We also found evidence that parasitic nestlings mimic the begging calls of their respective hosts. Uh, I'll play for you now the begging calls of the common waxbill. And you can compare that to the begging calls of its parasite, the pintailed wider. Uh, and again, both listening to those recordings and seeing the sonograms, you can see the structural similarities. And finally, we found that the parasites seem to also mimic the postural movements that the hosts make when begging for food. Uh, so here's a, a young orange ring petilia, the host begging for food. And you can see the way it waves its head from side to side and also sticks out its tongue. And then here's a newly hatched broad-tailed paradise wider chick, again, waving its head in a similar manner and also extruding its tongue. Uh, so if you're interested in going into more depth, and particularly in learning about uh, the details of how the statistical evidence of mimicry was gathered, and also in exploring the consequences of this uh, host-specific mimicry for speciation in the group, uh, I'd really recommend reading our recent paper, which is uh, open access in the journal Evolution. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank all my co-authors who were involved in this project, uh, and particularly thanks to Claire Spottiswood, who was my PhD supervisor uh, whilst I was carrying out uh, all of this work. Also, if you want to learn more about the research our group does, I'd recommend going to our website, africancuckoos.com, and you can also follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'd also like to thank the many people in Zambia without whom this work would not be possible, uh, particularly those who help us to find the nests at our field site in Choma. Uh, also, thanks to the several institutions who supported this work and to the Leverhulme Trust for funding it. And thank you to you for listening.